And we're recording. And I'm delighted to have with me Brad Marshall, um, who's a pig farmer, a butcher, a charcutier, a food historian, a molecular biologist, a database programmer. He invented the croissant diet and he coined the term low poof of pork. Welcome on again, Brad. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been a little while. A couple of years, right? A couple of years. Yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed having you on the first time. I really appreciate you coming on again. The first time you were on, the episode was called The Croissant Diet. And yeah. um, that's something that you developed and wrote about on your blog, uh, Fire in a Bottle. And you have also been selling what you call low poof of pork for some time. Um, and maybe you could, we spoke before about how we could um, get into this which is kind of a technical area you know you're a technical guy and you like to um you like to th think about how different cellular mechanisms kind of um cascade in the body and fit in with all the other ones and what are the dominant ones in terms of metabolism you know how we get energy how we feel subjectively energetic um overweight uh normal way how our appetite is how our mood is etc and so we said that maybe a good way into all of this might be to start with like what you recommend um or what you do yourself based on what you've um studied and written about and done on your on your youtube channel um and then go from there so you know the croissant diet low proof of pork you talk about poor tea a lot the type of fermented tea um and low linoleic acid, low uh, omega-6, particularly linoleic acid. So yeah. why don't you talk around all that stuff? Sure. And so uh, let's start with the with the low linoleic acid because I think that's um, uh, really kind of the thread that ties a lot of these things together. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, as you say, uh, traditional diets and, and food history and i think a lot about what the traditional diets of um you know i live in upstate new york uh as we were just talking about and it's january and the light levels are very low but um you know people here this is a this is a dairying area traditionally um you know as is much of uh, uh Europe as is much of the world right and I study a lot the the traditional diet of kind of France and upstate New York those are my kind of guideposts and you know that diet was pretty low in polyunsaturated fat um the main the main fat would have been uh butter um dairy fat uh the the cow was the you know when you when you live in a homestead economy the cow is all the dairy cow is always the center of the homestead and that is, you know, all sort of the, the entire ecology of the homestead sort of flows through the dairy cow, as well as, you know, a lot of the food, because obviously um, all the milk and butter comes from the cow. Um, and, and so butter is only about maybe 2% polyunsaturated fat or actually less probably in a traditional um, grass fed cow that wasn't fed grains. It's probably only something like one and a half percent polyunsaturated fat. And, and interestingly, um, yeah, and dairy is also pretty low in monounsaturated fats. So butter is a, is a quite saturated source of fat. And that was the traditional, you know, that was the traditional fat um, that uh, certainly the U.S. And, and Europe ate for, well, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years in Europe. And, um, and those societies were pretty lean. Uh, if you look back at people in New York, um, you know, I was recently, I was just looking at um, World Series photos, right? And so that, so the World Series is a baseball game and, and uh, or a baseball series for those of you who don't know that happens in America. And, um, and the Yankees uh, are a New York team and uh they have they've been very good so there's been a lot of world series in uh in yankee stadium and um and so there's tons of photos that you can find in the old yankee stadium and all these baseball games and it's amazing just to see you know the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people 
and uh, dress standards have changed. They all have a, a like a bowler cap and they're all wearing a suit at the baseball game. But, um, <laughs> but, but beyond that, you also notice there's really no, you don't really see any obesity. And, and all these people were eating this very kind of traditional American diet, which was um, whole milk, butter, um, white bread, potatoes, um, pie, you know, apple pie was it, the phrase American. It's um, as American as apple pie is, is real. Like every, you know, I think almost everyone ate pie. Uh, if you go back to the 1930s, say, um, and so you had what was really considered today a very rich, uh, palatable diet. And, and what I like about the Yankee stadium photos is that when these photos are taken from the field and you're looking at the front, you know, the front several rows in Yankee stadium, these are not, um, you know, these are not farmers, right? These are banking executives and advertising executives. And they're, they're, um, you know, by that time, uh, the subways had all been built, uh, the, you know, buildings had elevators, people took the cab to work. So this is not a particularly active population, presumably. And they had the means to feed themselves with however many calories they felt like. Right, exactly. And and so I have this great USDA um, yearbook of agriculture from 1939, and they do a, um, uh, and they look at how much food people consumed in the 30s. And, uh, you know, it's a lot. Um, and, and interestingly, the more money people had, the more food they bought, um, period. And so in the rich, the wealthiest um, Americans in the 1930s, presumably these are the people in the front row at Yankee Stadium. Uh, you know, their their average, according to the USDA, the average number of calories uh, used by the household. It doesn't necessarily mean eaten. They may have, they probably wasted some, but but that was a very frugal generation. They didn't like to waste, um, and it was like 4,500 calories per adult male in East coast cities was the amount of calories that, that families went through, you know, according to the USDA and I think 1939. And so you see this. Uh, so what you see is this population that's very lean and, you know, you can look at, you can make the same argument about, um, you know, places in France, although um, it's obviously a little different what was happening in Europe then. Um, but um Anyway, the point is, you see this diet, and it's very low in polyunsaturated fat. It's a very rich diet, but yet you don't see a lot of obesity. And it's not that people were people ate meat, um, they ate pork and beef, uh, they ate white flour, they ate potato. You know, it's not like it was high carb or low carb, or um, it certainly wasn't low calorie, and it was very rich. And they didn't avoid sugar. You know, they were eating lots of sugar, um, and and they were very lean. And so that's kind of the, the historical basis. Um, and then sure. And so then over the course of the century, um, the main food that was added to that diet was soybean oil. And so soybean oil went from being essentially, I mean, we didn't even really grow soybeans in the U S in the year 1900, uh, they had been introduced. There was a few curiosity articles about them in agricultural magazines, uh, it, but it was over the course of the, you know, by the 1930s and 1940s, they had realized that the the protein in the soybeans were really good to grow animals on. Plus, um, soybeans have estrogenic hormones, and that made the the pigs and the chickens grow faster. So they realized, oh, these soybeans are great for growing livestock, and then you know, they had this waste product, which was the soybean oil. And so what are we going to do with it? And they, you know, they started feeding it to people. Right. And so, and then over the century, it worked its way into potato chips and crackers and, um, and all of the things. And, uh, <laughs> and it's a funny thing because I think that, so obviously these polyunsat, so poly, so vegetable oils have a lot of polyunsaturated fats and the polyunsaturated fats have a very um uh i don't want to say this wrong a very high melting point which means they're liquid at room temperature they're liquid in the refrigerator 
So if you, you know, um, so they stay liquid at very low temperatures. And, um, and there was a lot of research around this in the 1950s and 60s because uh, the idea that saturated fat caused heart disease, right, was trending. And, um, and they thought that these polyunsaturated fats, they essentially were thinking about these saturated fats on a fairly simple, like a, I call it the sink drain analogy, but the idea that, you know, saturated fats clog your sink drain um, and liquid oils are less likely to do that because they don't become a solid at the temperature that you're running things down the drain. And I think that was sort of how they were thinking about heart disease at the time is that, oh, these hard fats clog your arteries and these liquid ones don't. Um, and so anyway, um, the perfect example so was, of one of these just so stories that we, we tell, like it seems to make sense intuitively, but it's, uh, it's just made up. Yeah. It's just kind of made up. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so, so anyways, but because of that, there was a lot of research done on, um, the effects of these polyunsaturated fats because they weren't, they weren't really, um, they had never been consumed on a wide basis yet. Right. And these guys were, con were, were actively telling people, um, you should eat more of these, you know, this, because there really was a wave of heart disease happening at the time. And they thought this was the answer was to, you know, was to, to desaturate the fats. Um, and, and they did a lot of studies and, um, uh, there's a funny thing that happens with, um, vegetable oils and short-term feeding studies where if you feed people a lot of if you feed people a meal of vegetable oil or a meal of saturated fat um in the short term and a couple hours later you go oh the the people who ate the vegetable oil are actually burning more fat um uh that's true right and so if you eat soybean oil if you eat like soybean oil on your mashed potatoes two hours later you'll be burning more fat than if you ate saturated fat with your mashed potatoes um and so people looked at that and they were like oh this is great uh these you know we burn these polyunsaturated fats faster than we burn saturated fats and if we eat them with potatoes that means we uh yeah we burn more fat and this is great because we want to burn fat right um and that and that's all true and this has been repeated many many times uh, but the problem with that is that, in fact, if you eat um, potatoes with fat, uh, as, you know, the traditional American and French diets did, the correct thing to do is to use the carbohydrates first and then burn the oil. Right. And so um, and so this this kind of short term observation that looked that seemed to a lot of people like a really good thing, I think, is actually a very dangerous thing. Um, you know, I think that in a mixed diet, if you, like I say, if you eat, you know, starch with fat, um, the correct thing to do is to burn the starch first. Um, and that is how, you know, and that's what happens if you eat bread and butter. Um, but the opposite happens if you eat bread and oil. And so what happens is the carbohydrates, um, if you're eating soybean oil, sure. If you're eating soybean oil on bread. Um, what should happen is you, you have the surge of insulin, uh, the, the starch is broken down into glucose, the glucose comes into your cells, you burn that once that's gone, then you switch back to burning fat. Um, with vegetable oils, what happens is you burn the oil first. And what that does is it increases the amount of, of kind of acetyl CoA in, in the cells and, and I apologize, we're going to get a little bit technical here. Um, so that increases the amount of things like NADH and acetyl-CoA in the cells. And that actually inhibits, um, something called, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is kind of the limiting enzyme that allows you to burn, uh, carbohydrates as fuel. Yes. And, and so, for people who, for people who are thinking, okay, there's a red flag, all of the names of these molecules. I would suggest that if people really want to dig in, uh, read Brad's um, blog, but also if you want to go right from the start like I did, then go over to Hyper the Hyperlipid blog 
and read the protons thread, which is like 40 or 50 posts or something, where it really starts about how mitochondria work, um, the history of it, and and then hearing about these molecules isn't as scary because you know that it's like a, a cast of characters in a play somehow, you know? We were talking yeah. before about how um, over the course of a billion years where, you know, mitochondria sprung up at some point along that um, timeline, you know, doing various different new things, evolution's tried so much. It, you know, to the first approximation, evolution's tried everything in a billion years. So you're going to have all of these molecules doing five or ten things in different processes, and you just have to sort of shine a little torchlight on wherever you can. And so I wouldn't feel, um, if you're listening to this, that you need to worry too much about remembering various different molecular names and so on. It's but that they, but they they interact in a very specific way with mitochondria, and then you end up with um, very specific results. And um, you've you've really been finding scientific papers that show these results, right? Yeah, yeah. And so there's one, um, there's one that I really like. And so I'm just real quick, I'll explain what pyruvate uh, dehydrogenase is. So um, when you burn, when you burn glucose, um, it gets turned into pyruvate. And then that, and that happens in the, uh, in the cytosol of the cell. And it's the pyruvate that gets transported into the mitochondria. Um and so uh, people have probably heard of glycolysis. So uh, the glucose comes into the cell. Glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm that converts it to um, two moles, molecules of pyruvate. The pyruvate goes into the cell and into the, uh, sorry, into the mitochondria. And it gets converted to acetyl-CoA. And then it gets burned in the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. And, and most of the energy released from burning glucose happens in that Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. And so everything up to pyruvate doesn't provide much energy from glucose. Then pyruvate dehydrogenase is the limiting thing that converts it to acetyl-CoA so that it can go into the Krebs cycle so that we can actually burn glucose, right? And if, and if um, pyruvate dehydrogenase is not functioning, then we really can't get much energy um, by burning uh, glucose or by burning starch. And what happens is it gets redirected uh, into de novo lipogenesis, which just means making new fat. And so, right. So when we eat, um, when you eat any carbohydrates, as they come in, you essentially have a choice. Do you want to burn it and get ATP and energy from it? Or do you want to convert it from fat? And a key limiting enzyme uh, in making that decision is pyruvate dehydrogenase. And so, um, so there was a really cool study that was done. And I think it was done in like the nineties. Um, this guy took, um, young, sorry, my phone is, um, I don't know why it's complaining about the battery plugged in anyway. Um, so this guy took, um, young college athletes, um, or college athletes, and he gave them either, um, and they were riding these stationary bikes and he gave them either, um, uh, I believe it was sunflower oil or heavy cream and some kind of like shake. And he just, he, so basically they were there for like four hours and one group had all this vegetable oil and the other group, uh, ate all this cream. And then, um, they had them ride these stationary bikes just for like a minute. And then they, I think then they took a muscle um, biopsy and they tested whether or not they had active pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is the thing that lets you burn glucose rather than converting it into fat. And so what happened was um, the, the people who were given the sunflower oil, they did not have, they did not activate pyruvate dehydrogenase. Uh, in response to the cycling and the people who ate the cream did. And so, um, and so vegetable oil has this very fundamental characteristic that it sort of inhibits your ability to use, to burn starch as, you know, oxidatively to burn it as fuel, to make ATP. 
um it 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 prefers to uh yeah uh shunt your carbohydrates into fat making um and that all happens um i have the uh i have a new youtube channel and i have a, a video on there uh called the onion of life um and i actually think that's sort of how i have come to think about things and it's sort of like you say um we have this billion years of evolution and a lot of the processes that happen in a cell are far more ancient than the newer things that have kind of been layered on top of it, right? And that's the onion analogy is that we started with this kind of central core of biology and the things that, that were controlling the oldest cells were things like the ratio of NAD plus to NADH. Um, NAD is an electric carrier. Most of biology is just electrons moving around. And NAD plus, when it has electrons, it becomes NADH. Um, and when it loses the electrons, it's NAD plus. And so that ratio kind of tells the cells how much energy there is. And the cell is making decisions based on that ratio. Um, and then, so then as we move outside and we start talking about things like pyruvate dehydrogenase and um, so many things, you know, amp kinase and, um, mTOR and all of these things are in different ways. They're just manipulating the NAD plus the NADH ratio, but they're also uh, reading the NAD plus ratio and they're acting accordingly. And so um, the ratio of NADH to NAD plus, it, it turns out is this incredibly um, important controller of what each cell decides to do. And what happens with when you know, when these cyclists are eating the sunflower oil is that the, the polyunsaturated fat, like I say, they are transported faster and they're transported into the mitochondria faster. And they essentially are unleashing a lot of acetyl-CoA and that acetyl-CoA is being uh, very rapidly turned by the TCA cycle into NADH. And the NADH and the acetyl-CoA themselves inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase. Um, and so this is a very old, right? We have this regulatory mechanism where the cells will either um, burn fat or they'll burn carbohydrates. And, and when they're burning one, they kind of inhibit the burning of the other. Um, and so the vegetable oils kind of like jump up in line and they demand to be burned first and the fact that they're being burned is inhibiting the burning of the, um, you know, of the glucose. Um, and I'm flaking on that. There's a, that, that process of fat inhibiting, uh, carbohydrate burning and the other way around, uh, has a name and I'm forgetting it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Off the top of my head, it's, uh, the Randall cycle, that's what it's called. Um, so if you look up the Randall cycle, uh, you can see, the, there's just a couple key kind of enzymes and key steps that control whether cells are burning glucose or fat. And essentially the, the vegetable oils are kind of, they're sort of, uh, yeah, they're overturning the Randall cycle or they're, they're controlling the Randall cycle uh, in a way that I would argue is inappropriate um, in response to a mixed meal, right? Um, and that's a long way of <laughs> saying that uh, but that initial observation that when you eat starch with fat, you should burn the starch first. And when you eat the starch with vegetable oil, that doesn't happen because the vegetable oil overwhelms the Randall cycle. Um, and that is, that is a, I, I just think a really key and fundamental point um, that I don't hear a lot of people talking about, but uh, yeah, when I look at it in my world and think about NAD plus and NADH, I think that's a really key study and a really key observation. Um, yeah, and it's a great um, starting point to talk about, you know, you're sort of beyond the idea that carbs are somehow inherently damaging. You know, there's like a whole swathe of uh, the sort of, of nutrition Twitter who would say, carbs have caused so much damage and then you really don't have to look very deeply to see that it can't be the carbs per se you know i would i would argue that um something in um gluten gluten grains 
has maybe got worse over the last hundred years, but maybe not. And it's there's certainly something um it seems to me interacting between uh gluten and and these kind of uh, vegetable oils with linoleic acid in them as well that seem to have you know uh have increased autoimmune diseases but um you know a lot of the world eat, eat uh, a lot of wheat and they don't have the same dreadful health issues that populations who eat a lot of linoleic acid eat. and then you only have to see you know um people like the Japanese up until, you know, 40 years ago or something who were eating like 80% of their diet and white rice. And they were the picture of health, 80% of the calories, I should say. So um, it's not the carbs per se. And what you're talking about really goes beyond that and starts looking at, um, so what is it and why? And I think that's a great human experiment because a lot of people talk about mouse experiments and they get um, attacked for that. But the onion, as you describe it, allows for that because some of these processes are so ancient that um, the kind of uh, experiments you can do on mice are perfectly appropriate. Yeah, and 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 so the you know right the NAD plus NAD plus and NADH were carrying electrons presumably in the first cell from what 3.2 billion years ago i think so we have 3.2 billion years of the nad plus to nadh ratio being the kind of like fundamental um it's kind of like is the gas tank full you know if you have a lot of nadh um there's a lot of energy right now and that can be a problem if there's too much energy um, yeah, because you talk about you talk about the cell telling um the outside of the cell this information but of course if you look at that over the whole body, you get this systemic effect. You know, it really, these effects are all over the body at once, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's different in all tissues, but, um, but it's all, you know, it's all communicating. And, um, you know, and a lot of this, I think, I think, I think the fundamental processes are always the same. You know, if you talk about m mouse versus human experiments, I, I think that um, when you're burning fat, it does push the NADH to NAD plus ratio higher than it does if you're burning carbohydrates um, in general. And that is but then I think what happens is a mouse, um, you know, it, I think if it is like, we're all sort of mammals, right? But like, if you go into the control panel and you just like, you know, it's like if you go into the control panel and you start with a horse and you like tweak a few settings, you make the legs longer and the neck longer. Now it's a giraffe, right? And so, um, but essentially the program that we're running is the same, right? And it, And so we have all the same transport enzymes and, um, and so a lot of it, I think has to do like, so, okay, so maybe mice are, and I, and I believe that they are, uh, more prone to become, um, overweight if, if you feed them a high fat diet, like maybe 45% of calories as fat, um, in the lab, you can pretty reliably fat number mouse. And that's probably due to the fact that like the dynamics of the way that the fat is absorbed and how fast it's transported and how fast the enzymes work and how fast it goes into the mitochondria. Um, you know, what we really want at the end of the day, um, what we really want is just to burn all of our fuel cleanly. Right. And what happens is um, NADH and NAD plus are really just uh, it's another way of looking at oxygen. Right. So, in our systems, we're eating, um, you know, we're essentially eating hydrocarbons. It's not unlike what happens in your car, which is why I make that analogy. We're eating hydrocarbons, you know, fat and starch are made of hydrogen and carbon, just like the gasoline that you put in your car, right? And then in your car, you mix the gas uh, with a certain amount of air, which has oxygen in it, and it burns, and that's what makes the energy. And if you don't have enough oxygen, um, that's when you see, you know, black smoke coming out of the tailpipe. You see that unburnt fuel. Um, and the body's no different. The mitochondria is doing the same thing as the spark plugs in your car is doing. It's taking 
um, you know, it's taking in these hydrocarbon fuels and it's releasing and it's burning, it's combining it with oxygen, right? And it's releasing H2O and CO2. And the question is, do you have enough oxygen to completely burn the fuel? And the NAD plus and the NADH are really uh, just oxygen uh, because the thing that is directly oxidizing the food is NAD plus. And so you need a bunch of NAD plus to, to make sure that the food is fully oxidized or fully burned. So you don't have um, these extra waste products because the extra waste products are the things that wind up back in your bloodstream and they kind of, they kind of bog everything down. Um, yeah. Because so, it's a- so with, with that in mind, with the oxidation and the waste process, uh, given different types of meals in mind, it makes me think about how we spoke about before the problem with calories in, calories out. And thinking back to your first point about the Yankees fans who are all slim, who according to the USDA were eating richly as much as 4,500 calories a day per adult male. Um, why didn't they store that as fat? What's going on there? Why is this, if you've got like, um, an energy balance, energy in equals energy out, uh, calories in, calories out. Why does eating, um, l- you know, vegetable oils cause the energy uh, out to actually um, go down and other types of diets, what types of diets make the energy out go up? Yeah, and so, so that is... Right. So that's a really interesting question. And that harkens back to, like you said at the beginning, sort of the proton thread and hyperlipid and what I talk about in my blog. And so it turns out that we um, we make these things called um, uh, free radicals or reactive oxygen species. It's really superoxide. Um, superoxide is, is an oxygen molecule that has grabbed an extra electron. Um, and and so people are scared of free radicals. Uh, they think that they cause cellular damage, and they they can if they build up. And so and so uh, it's a little bit of a scary topic. But what happens is, in fact, when you look at the way that the that these free that superoxide um, there's something called superoxide dismutase, which makes it into hydrogen peroxide, which we're all familiar with, right? Because you can get it in the brown bottle at the drugstore. Um, and so all of our cells make this hydrogen peroxide. And the way that we get rid of the hydrogen peroxide, uh, people may have heard of glutathione. Um, we, have this, we have this antioxidant system baked into us, the glutathione system. And the glutathione converts the hydrogen peroxide back harmlessly to water. And um, the sort of amazing part about this system is that it uses, well, it uses NADPH to, uh, and the enzyme called glutathione reductase to eliminate the hydrogen peroxide. And that NADPH becomes NADP plus. And there's another thing called NNT, which converts it back to NAD plus. And so, so as we make this, um, as we make this superoxide in the mitochondria, uh, we have these enzyme systems that get rid of it. And the whole time that they're doing that, they're returning NAD+. And so um, if it's done in the right context, uh, the creation of, or yeah, the creation of these, uh, of superoxide and these reactive oxygen species is actually increasing the amount of oxygen burned. It's helping us to burn the food uh, cleanly. And so saturated fats, due to the way that the mitochondria is set up, um, they create more of these uh, of these of the superoxide than do unsaturated fats, and so um, monounsaturated fats like an olive oil uh, make significantly less um, superoxide, and polyunsaturated fat probably even a little bit less than the monounsaturated fat in olive oil, and so and so all of these unsaturated fats are essentially um, because they're not creating superoxide, because they're not recycling NAD plus, uh, they don't they don't burn as cleanly, and so th- then you have then you have a buildup of NADH, and 
we're going to, and, and I'll take it even back to carbohydrate metabolism. And this is something that I've kind of, I've added on to the, the hyperlipid um, protons ideas in the last year is that the other things in the mitochondria and one of the other major things in the mitochondria that creates um, superoxide as it does its job is pyruvate dehydrogenase, right? So we've already talked about that. That's the enzyme that is the limiting factor of, of glucose burning, right? And so that scenario that I was talking about where you're eating starch with vegetable oil versus starch with butter, right? Um, so two, so <laughs> in the case that you're eating uh, starch with butter, the pyruvate is being converted to acetyl-CoA first, and that's generating reactive oxygen species. That's, that's uh, giving you NAD plus back, right? And that's all good. And, and you're burning the, the starch from that bread. And then as the, as the glucose levels drop, then the fast from the butter can come in and be burned and they're saturated. So they're making superoxide and they're returning NAD plus and that process can kind of happen cleanly and everything burns. But in the case of the vegetable oil, uh, the vegetable oil gets priority for burning. And that does two things. One is the vegetable oil itself, as it's being burned, doesn't create as much superoxide. So you're not getting as much NAD plus back. But that also means that um, pyruvate dehydrogenase becomes inhibited. And pyruvate dehydrogenase is the other major source of, of superoxide production. And so you're really doubling, you're doubling up on the problem because not only do the vegetable oils not create as much um, superoxide as they burn, but they're preventing pyruvate from being burned oxidatively. And that's also preventing the superoxide formation. And that's also preventing uh, the, the, the regeneration of NAD plus. And NAD plus essentially controls your metabolic rate. Um, the, the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle, all of our foods get made into acetyl-CoA and it takes three NAD plus to uh, burn an acetyl-CoA molecule. And so, you know, quite simply stated, uh, the more NAD plus there is, the faster the TCA cycle goes. Um, and yeah, and the more, the faster you burn your calories, the more cleanly um, and you you have a good metabolic rate um so is it reasonable say, to say that your recommendations are based on increasing nad plus ultimately yes that 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 is the common denominator is is replacing that nad plus um and also uh yeah i think the things that build up in the mitochondria that really bog down your metabolism and lead to um obesity and lead to heart disease and cancer and a lot of these things are it's essentially a buildup of nad plus but that also or sorry let me say that again it's a buildup of nadh um and that so you have too much nadh and not enough nad plus and then what happens is that that sort of starts this downward spiral because um when that happens the tca cycle slows down and acetyl CoA levels build up. Um, and if there's not enough NAD, uh, there's these enzymes called sirtuins, and they need the NAD to do their job. Um, but what the acetyl groups do is they actually gum up mitochondrial enzymes. And the sirtuin enzymes remove the acetyl groups from those mitochondrial enzymes. So what starts to happen is, is that NADH gets too high and NAD plus gets too low. Then your mitochondrial enzymes, they get acetylated and they, they get turned off. And that acetylation is just simply caused by um, there's not enough NAD plus. The citric acid cycle slows down. The citric acid cycle is the thing that burns the acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA levels rise and that acetyl-CoA is um, those acetyl groups. And this doesn't even require an enzyme. It seems like this is a spontaneous process. Um, as the acetyl groups rise, they will just simply stick to um, 
your mitochondrial enzymes and turn them off and your metabolic rate drops. And since NAD plus is limited, um, the enzymes, uh, cert one and cert three, whose job is to take those acetyl groups back off. Uh, they can only do their job if there's enough NAD plus and the lack of NAD plus is why the acetyl groups kind of built up in the first place. And so when that NADH to NAD plus ratio gets out of whack, uh, your metabolic rate really bogs down. Um, and there's a lot of experiments that I've shown on the blog that, that can, you know, that shows that really that <laughs> it really is that ratio that is, uh, incredibly crucial to, um, sort of how much, yeah, how many cal or whatever, how many calories per kilogram of lean mass that you burn in an hour. I'm not even doing anything. If you're just sitting on the couch, you know, if your mitochondrial enzymes aren't acetylated, you're going to burn a lot more calories um, than, than if they are. And so over the course of 24 hours, of course, that, that really builds up. Um, and I think explains a lot of what's causing the obesity, you know, and it's not necessarily huge numbers, but I think that it's like, yeah, I mean, maybe it's 200 calories a day though. Um, and you know, and you, you're not, you don't have to eat less or move more or do anything. It's just an extra 200 calories out the door every day because you're not, you know, because your enzymes are functioning, um, the way they should. And, and it seems to act at all ends, doesn't it? Because you've got, you know, things like effect on, uh, leptin, uh, uh, one of the hormones that controls hunger and, um, you know, this amp kinase that you've spoken about before as well, where, you know, it, it's not just that you sort of downregulate metabolism so that you, you know, you probably feel a bit colder, you probably feel a bit more lethargic. It's that if you do the opposite and you, um, you, you, you know, you minimize your linoleic acid, you drink your poor tea, uh, et cetera, then, you know, your hunger is actually lower, but your metabolic rate's higher. So you, you, you find yourself, um, in moving in the opposite direction. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. And there's, there are all, you know, there's a ton of these feedback loops in the body and, um, and they all, they all seem to build on each other, you know, and, and that's the thing I've noticed is researching all these papers. It's like, every time you start to see, you're like, oh, well that happens. And, you know, it's like NADH builds up. Oh, but then you've got acetyl-CoA and, and the sirtuins aren't working and then things start to get acetylated. And then, oh, for this other reason, because that happened, right. Now your, your appetite is dysregulated. And like you say, yeah, leptin goes up. Um, and so these things happen in the, you know, obviously the reason I think that um, these things are all happening in this seemingly very coordinated fashion, right? Like it's not, it's not by chance that this, this thing leads to that thing, leads to this thing, leads to that thing, leads to that thing, leads to obesity. Uh, it's probably part of an evolutionary strategy. Um, you know, and I talk a lot in my blog about torpor, which is the idea that, um, oh, hold on one second. Something is, let me, let me grab, if you want to, kill a little time i gotta i think that my charger isn't working i'll be right back i got another one right in the other room right so anyway what i was saying is that um you know when you see this when you see this very coordinated response that looks like everything is leading towards obesity um that is probably part of an evolutionary strategy and so on my blog i talk a lot about torpor uh, which is the idea that mammals um have these kind of inbuilt sensors and they what those sensors are looking at are things like is winter coming or um, in some cases is the dry season coming and they're trying to integrate all these environmental signals and say like okay um it seems like winter's coming we need to fatten up right and so um and slow down so, ultimately what's that fatten up then slow down Fatten up and slow down ultimately. Right. And if you look at what, and if you look at how these systems work, um, a lot of what they're doing, maybe 85% of what they're doing is just manipulating the NADH to NAD plus ratio, like in the liver and in the adipose tissue to favor fat storage. Right. Um, 
it's more compli- it's very complicated how they do it and you can spend days and weeks uh you know trying to track down every gene that they're changing and what they're upregulating but at the end of the day they're just you know if we go back to that idea of the onion they're mostly just manipulating um that that fundamental ratio um and so you know i've positive i put forward this this is my theory um as far as i know no one has studied this but uh, my my thought is this thing called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor which i've been talking a lot of, uh, lately on my videos is the sort of fundamental controller of torpor this kind of alternate um this alternate metabolic state that favors fat storage um and there's a lot of evidence that it is increased in obesity um and in diabetes and and there's a lot of evidence that it's increased in hibernating animals as well. Um, and so, uh, and, and it's, and it's changing all these enzymes that are, um, you know, so one of them, for instance, is this thing called PARP and obese people make a lot more PARP and PARP is a DNA repair enzyme. So you think, oh, well, that sounds good. We need, we need DNA repair, right? That sounds important. Um, except that what happens is, you know, we only need as much of it as we need. And, uh, the enzyme PARP uses NAD plus as, um, you know, as fuel basically. And so, so PARP takes NAD plus and it breaks it into two molecules. And one of those is, um, um, I'm spacing on the name, uh, nicotinamide. Yeah. It's just called nicotinamide. And so the, so every time the PARP does its thing, it's, it's, it's so um, in metabolism, NAD plus gets, gets a, um, gets an electron and it's converted to NADH, but the NADH can rapidly give the electron to up at the mitochondrial electron transport chain. And it just comes back to NAD plus uh, PARP actually takes uh, NAD plus and it breaks it in half. And it makes it a nicotinamide, and then the nicotinamide has to get recycled. Um, there is a way to convert the nicotinamide back to NAD+. And also, by the way, um, uh, niacin, uh, which is vitamin B3, 2, I forget which one is which. Uh, niacin is essentially where uh, NAD+, comes from, and, you know, ultimately. Um, but, and the other thing that, the aryl hydrocarbon receptor does is it um, down regulates something called NAMPT, which is the enzyme that converts that nicotinamide back to NAD plus. And so, um, and so this uh, AHR is putting this kind of twofold hit on NAD levels. Um, it makes this enzyme that converts it to nicotinamide, and then it reduces the enzyme that that um, you know salvages nicotinamide and converts it back to NAD plus. And so it's really just dragging down NAD plus levels and that, um, yeah. And that leads to obesity pretty, pretty regularly and, and lower metabolism, lower metabolic rate. Exactly. And um, so like, you know, you know, I'm thinking more and more about mental health. And if we think about the mental acuity of a hibernating bear. Yeah. Uh, you might characterize that as torpid or uh, slow. Yeah. Um, what do you think about um, these mechanisms in the brain um, or yeah, just in terms of the energy availability even for the brain? Yeah, I mean, so, so I'm not an expert on... Uh mental health but but there are um so one of the things that you see is that um so the one of the main um uh, endogenous meaning it doesn't come from your diet it's something that you make um things that activates the era hydrocarbon receptor um it, it, and initiates torpor and you see that it rises both in obese humans and in animals approaching hibernation and then goes even higher while they're in hibernation is this thing called kinurinine. So kinurinine is a tryptophan metabolite. Um, and interestingly, kinurinine is 
uh, you know, things like serotonin and melatonin and, every, you know, serotonin is obviously important to mental health. That's also another tryptophan metabolite. And so um, yeah. you, you see a lot of uh, there's a lot of action in this kind of tryptophan pathway that is uh seems crucial uh metabolically but also is obviously very important to um mental health and something i've i've uh recently become very interested in is there are a couple of drugs for um uh, schizophrenia and they're um they're secondary drugs so there's sort of the first line treatments of schizophrenia um, but but for people who who are not helped by those first line drugs, uh, they give them uh, drugs like clozapine, and I can't remember the name of the second one. But uh, clozapine is very interesting. It affects um, it definitely is affecting tryptophan metabolism, and that's probably how it's helping with um, you know schizophrenic symptoms. Um, but it also is an activator of the era hydrocarbon receptor. Um, probably the way it works is it probably looks like uh, a molecule in the tryptophan metabolism pathway. And so it's probably kind of uh, either blocking some of those enzymes. And people who are given clozapine have dramatic weight gain. Um, and not only do they have dramatic weight gain, uh, it causes type two diabetes. And so in some of these studies, um, at the beginning of the study, you know, 0% of the population will have type 2 diabetes. Within five years, uh, sometimes as much as 40% of the people have developed type 2 diabetes. And if and you so, think about the, the rates of diagnosis for type 2 diabetes, when they cross the line into their, you know, um, their blood glucose response being, frankly, type 2 diabetic. If you think 40% are, then um, likely another 40, perhaps, are what you might call pre-diabetic. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. But like, you know, and w w but also when you think about diabetes, it's like diabetes is something that happens, you know, over your lifetime. And you might be you might be pre-diabetic for 20 years before you become diabetic. You know, the the rate at which the diabetes progresses on this clozapine is is uh, you know it's unbelievable and dramatic and so uh so to me it's a very interesting um demonstration that these um these tryptophan pathways and diabetes and obesity are really all kind of you know tied at the hip or whatever i don't think that's how that phrase goes but <laughs> you know um I just, it's just, it's been very interesting to me. And, and that is just, uh, been a, been a recent fun area. I mean, it's not really a fun area of research. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of depressing actually, but, um, but it is a very interesting, uh, you know, demonstration of, of those links, right. Between, um, between whatever is, is happening with, uh, yeah, tryptophan and serotonin and can urinine and obesity. And because I, I mean, I don't, do you know um, the the levels of kinurinine in? I think I've seen that kinurinine is often higher in, um, you know, mental mental health disorders. But I, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure that's how it works. I, I'm not. I don't know if that's something you've looked at at all. No, I I'll, I would need to I would need to uh, investigate that. Yeah, I know that there's I certain just... metabolites which. Um, seem to be elevated in certain conditions and you know many of these have been tied to type 2 diabetes as well and insulin resist uh you know pathological insulin resistance yeah sure you know, like yeah. um cynthia calkin's paper talking about treating insulin resistance with metformin where they studied it on humans. right well so well so that's very interesting and so metformin um is one that um so there was a paper that came out i mean i guess this has been sort of known for a long time but there's a paper that came out fairly recently showing that metformin um uh pretty dramatically down regulates 
uh, the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. The thing that I've been talking about, um, you know, is triggering a lot of these things. And it so so the AHR has this positive feedback loop where it increases um, this enzyme called IDO, and IDO converts tryptophan to kinurinine, but then the kinurinine activates the aryl hydrocarbon receptor and that makes more IGO, which makes more kinurinine, which makes more AHR, right? And so, so you have this positive feedback loop. And one of the things that they have done with um, the people who are, who have to take this clozapine for uh, schizophrenia symptoms is they give them uh, metformin with the clozapine. And so the metformin prevents a lot of the weight loss and prevents a lot of the type two diabetes that's caused by the clozapine, um, interestingly. And so, you know, it's all, <laughs> it's all kind of right there, right? Um, uh, yeah, you see the aryl hydrocarbon receptor and the kinurinine and the metformin and the clozapine and the mental disease. And, and interestingly, it does that without affecting, however, the, the effectiveness of the clozapine on the schizophrenia symptoms. And so, um, which presumably yeah. is something to do with the tryptophan rather than say the negative metabolic effects, which may actually make things worse in other ways, I guess. Yeah. I mean, so it seems like in, in the studies that they've done with uh, the clozapine on tryptophan metabolism, the clozapine does a good job of actually returning uh, tryptophan metabolites kind of back to normal, kind of back to like baseline people that don't have schizophrenia. So so it seems like that is probably how it works is uh, by adjusting tryptophan metabolism. But then I think the problem with clozapine is the way that it does that is probably by mim mimicking a, um, a tryptophan metabolite and it, and it itself is activating the era hydrocarbon receptor in these um, other systems that are initiating torpor. And for some reason, the metformin is... Um, you know, is drawing down the expression of the era hydrocarbon receptor and sort of taking that out of the loop um, seems to be how maybe perhaps how it all works. I mean, there's a lot of guesswork yeah. there, but yeah, well, I mean, I think it is guesswork uh, for even for practicing psychiatrists, you know, Georgia Yid was talking in the last podcast episode about how she can prescribe drugs judiciously and advisedly and, you know, uh, after conversations with patients and you know really she doesn't know how they're going to affect the patient until they try it and yeah. there'll be a cocktail of um re results and sometimes like you say you have to have a cocktail of drugs to counteract you, you, you end up being like the the old lady who swallowed the fly um covering yeah. up one pathway from the last drug with a, another one from the new one and you know i think about 5-HTP, for what you're talking about, a lot of people take 5-HTP as a supplement, which is a, an amino acid uh, with a T standing for tryptophan, uh, precursor to serotonin, and people feel better uh, on, you know, whether, sometimes for anxiety, sometimes for low mood. Um, it, tryptophan is central to these in some way, seemingly. Yeah, well, and, and I think that... Um... Yeah, and I, and I think maybe, I think perhaps the reason for that is um, simply the fact that tryptophan, uh, you know, tryptophan as an amino acid has this large ring structure um, that most amino acids don't have. And, you know, I, I wonder if that is the reason for tryptophan's um, sort of centrality to these things is due to the fact that it's this aryl molecule as they call it which just means has a ring uh i think it's easier to act for it to act in kind of signaling pathways because that large planar ring structure is easy for um enzymes to kind of recognize or or receptors to recognize i mean there are a hydrocarbon receptor does but also we have these um yeah tryptophan receptors and in, in the in the brain and uh you know, I think it may just be a, a basic like a three dimensional thing is why the tryptophan is so important, because at first you're like, why? Yeah, you're like, why is this tryptophan so such a big deal? But then it, it all kind of, 
yeah it starts to make sense it'd be so very hard though, isn't it how you like it, it, on some level we are we are made up of lots of little machines and that sometimes it's about geometry of machine machinery parts yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so if people were to think about how to approach their metabolic health um would it be fair to say uh aggressively limit linoleic acid in the diet um you know however 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 you you can and drink poor tea and things should be fine or is that <laughs> is that unfair yeah i mean well so i mean <clears throat> you know i think if your goal is is um uh you know i talk about weight loss i think weight loss is a uh, um is a is a difficult it's a difficult goal right um if what what i would like to see um, what I'd like to figure out is in people who are essentially broken. And what I mean by broken is uh, they have an inability to properly utilize carbohydrates, right? Um, really what I mean is, yeah, uh, yeah, the pyruvate dehydrogenase, right? You have too much NADH, pyruvate dehydrogenase isn't working. They're not um, like the Yankees fans anymore. They're not like the Yankees fans anymore, right? And so, and and the question is, is there a way to put that back? Um, and and because I feel like if you could, if you could become those Yankees fans again, if you can become someone who can, um, you know, wake up and eat toast for breakfast and uh, mashed potatoes for dinner, and and you can burn those and run those through pyruvate dehydrogenase, then then that is that really I think is the um, the art of kind of metabolic flexibility. Right. Um, and those, yeah. And like I say, those Yankees fans were also eating, um, they were eating butter and whole milk and, and, and pork chops. And so I, I don't think that, I think there is a way to be able to eat a, you know, a mixed diet of, of containing both fat and carbohydrates as a human being and to be, and to have a good metabolic rate and to be lean and healthy. Um, and I think we've gone down a bad road. And, and the question is, you know, how do we put that back, obviously? And so I, I focus a lot on, um, well, the poor tea is, <laughs> the poor tea is sort of magic. Uh, uh, I've been selling this poor tea extract on my blog, which is the tea of Brownin, which seems to be the thing that gives it its, um, the, the potent part of the poor tea that makes the difference. And I've, I've been questioning for months, how, how does it work? And I don't really know, but, but everything, um, all, what all the papers are, are showing is that everything that like the era hydrocarbon receptor, the thing that's initiating this torpor, if it does this, then the poor tea is doing the opposite. And I, I don't really know why it <laughs> it's either because it's affecting gut bacteria or because it's a direct inhibitor of the aryl hydrocarbon receptor or, you know, maybe something else. I don't know. Um, so that, so that's really interesting, but there's a lot of good research on it that it's very good. Um, so that's something that I've been consuming and I take the extract um, as well. Um, but then I'm focusing really on things that help um, with that, um, that NADH to NAD plus level. And so uh, what are those things um, I've been taking? There's something called alpha lipoic acid, which is very potent. And you can, um, there's, there's this great paper where um, they took, you know, it's, it's in rodents, right? But they, it was like three different ways of fattening up rodents, right? There's like diet induced obesity. And then there's this other one where they give them like a, streptob streptob and they give them these drugs and and that gives them diabetes and then there's there's also ones that don't have any leptin receptor and those are obese and in all three of those models um alpha lipoic so what alpha lipoic acid does is um so we make alpha lipoic acid it's a cofactor in several of our enzymes um but the way that it's consumed is in the oxidized form. And so it's actually an oxidant. It's sort of the, if you read the literature, they'll call it an antioxidant, but it's actually the opposite of an antioxidant. Um, and so it oxidizes NADH back to NAD plus. 
And so it just gives you um, that NAD plus back. Um, and in all three of those mouse models, uh, you know, it has dramatic success at, at eliminating the obesity because much of, right, because much of the obesity is just simply caused by, by the NADH and NAD plus getting out of whack in my opinion. Um, but I've also been looking at specific, um, uh, I want to say parts of the TCA cycle. That's not quite true. Uh, you know, supplemental pyruvate is very interesting because, um, well, <laughs> pyruvate is lacking. So when the, when the glucose comes in uh, and goes through glycolysis, it actually gives off um, it gives off some NADH, and so it gives off some electrons before it becomes um, pyruvate to go into the into the mitochondria. And pyruvate in your blood, so there's this enzyme that can convert pyruvate back to lactate and what it does is it takes an nadh it takes the electrons from the nadh and it sticks them onto the pyruvate and it becomes lactate and so uh the pyruvate is sort of becomes an offloading molecule for um yeah for for nadh essentially and so this pyruvate if you take some pyruvate uh your body will offload a bunch of its NADH and convert it back to NAD plus. Um, and then the, a bunch of the pyruvate will become lactate, but probably not uh, as high of a lactate to pyruvate ratio as you had before. And interestingly, if you look in the blood at um, the ratio of lactate and pyruvate in the blood, it actually matches the ratio of NADH and NAD plus in your cytoplasm because um, pyruvate and lactate are rapidly um, taken into cells and then lactate dehydrogenase is an enzyme that works in both directions. So if you have a lot of lactate, it will make NADH. And if you have a lot of pyruvate, it'll make NAD plus. And then, and then they just get re-exported. So the, the pyruvate and lactate are um, this kind of medium that connects all of the cells and it kind of connects the the like redox balance of the whole organism uh, through this lactate and pyruvate and lactate dehydrogenase enzyme and these transporters that are constantly taking them in and out. And so pyruvate is this really powerful thing in terms of, you know, lowering that, that redox balance. Um, and so what I noticed with pyruvate, uh, which is kind of amazing is if I take enough, um, there was this weight loss study done in the eighties where, they were taking six grams of pyruvate, uh, maybe 12, I think they were taking 12 grams a day, which is a lot, right? <laughs> it's a lot of pyruvate. Um, and they and they had this pretty dramatic weight loss success in a very short-term trial and there weren't a lot of people in it. And, um, but it's, it's a fun, it's a, the paper is funny to read because it, it, the language is not like most scientific journals. They're like, the most amazing thing about this paper is like when we, when we had all the people in at the end, like, all of their family and friends came with them and they wanted to know how to get this pyruvate. Um, and, and so pyruvate had become this kind of trendy uh, uh, weight loss thing around the late nineties. And then some guy kind of, uh, I think he was an ex NFL player or something. And he, um, he did all these infomercials about pyruvate and he said all this stuff that wasn't really true. And he, you know, he made it out to be a lot more than it was and he got in trouble and, um, Anyway, and so I think a lot of people sort of threw out the baby with the bathwater and said, well, this pyruvate is is a bunch of hooey, but it's not. I think the pyruvate is actually, it's a useful tool, right? It's it's one tool that we have that I think is, anyway, what I was going to say about it is if I take a couple of grams of pyruvate and then I eat like um, a starchy meal, um, my body temperature will rise. Like I've I've measured, if I eat enough pyruvate and then a big starchy meal, I've sometimes measured my body temperature like 99.1 um, an hour or two after the meal. Like it'll, it'll easily go up to 98.8, 98.9. And yeah, sometimes even higher. And so that's an indication to me that, okay, the pyruvate really is, um, you know, causing my pyruvate dehydrogenase to work. And I'm, I think I'm actually burning some of this starch. I'm not just, you know, converting it all to fat, which is, I think, what I used to do and probably still do a lot of the time. And do you have a sense that if your metabolism is broken, that 
taking pyruvate or um, you know eating in a way that encourages a better pyruvate lactate uh, ratio, um, that you are fixing your metabolism, or by doing so, are you just uh, acting in a way that your broken metabolism works as best it can? Well, I think that I think it's. Um, I mean, I think it's the second. I think, you know, I'm not right. I'm not going to fix my metabolism in one day. Um, but I think that, you know, over time, I'm I'm hoping to get, um, you know, these things take time. And like one of the one of the problems that we have in obesity is that our stored fat um, actually becomes very high in monounsaturated fats. And so in our stored fat, we've converted a lot of our stearic acid to oleic acid. And so, like I say, that oleic acid, when it burns, doesn't generate the same kind of, of superoxide and you, it doesn't generate as much NAD plus ultimately as if I had stored saturated fat. And so, you know, I have this whole overhanging cliff of monounsaturated fat that I have stored in my body that I'm, that I'm kind of working against, right? But my thought is that if I can, um, if I continue to use things like pyruvate and um, alpha lipoic acid, um, the disadvantage of alpha lipoic acid, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, is it tends to give people like kind of like a, like a, like a, like a brain fog kind of condition if you take too much of it. And so I'm actually, anyway, there's a, there's an R lipoic acid, which is the, the, type that is specific to the mitochondria and i've heard anecdotally people have tried the r lipoic acid have had better luck with some of these symptoms than just regular alpha lipoic acid um uh side note but an important one so i've just ordered today ordered some of the r lipoic acid um and so i'm hoping that with the lipoic acid and with this um things like pyruvate I can start to burn more of these carbs. And that what that does is it um, by changing that NAD plus to NADH ratio, my body starts making less of like the SCD1, which is the enzyme that's converting all my stearic acid to oleic acid in the first place. And if I'm burning cleanly, then I'll burn some of that fat. And, and, you know, so I think that over a period of months, um, you know, we can reset some of those things, right? Like it's not going to, I'm not going to be fixed overnight. Um, but I think, you know, taking it one meal at a time is helpful. Um, and then the last thing that I'm, <laughs> that I've been experimenting with is, um, uh, succinate. Um, so succinate is very fun. Um, so the reason that, that, um, so in the Krebs cycle, we have, um, I think called complex two, uh, which is part of our electron transport chain in the mitochondria where we make ATP. It's also called succinate dehydrogenase. And the problem, the reason that unsaturated fats don't make as much um, superoxide and don't regenerate the NAD plus is that um, they don't have as much succinate dehydrogenase activity. They don't have as much activity at complex two which is an, an FAD input <laughs> to the electron transport chain rather than the normal NAD input. Um, and so that, and so if you can, when you look at obese humans, when you look at hibernating animals, one of the first things they downregulate when they want to lower, when a hibernating animal wants to lower its metabolic rate, one of the first things it does is it downregulates, well, there's two things, it downregulates complex two and it turns off pyruvate dehydrogenase. Right. And so these are the two in, in the in the hot blooded, clean burning animal. Um, you're burning carbs at uh, pyru or you're sending your carbs through pyruvate dehydrogenase and um, and your fat is producing a lot of activity at complex two, <laughs> which is succinate dehydrogenase. And so um, another thing I've been I've been selling is this. Um, I just got these disodium succinate capsules. And so um, that will, and, and succinate is preferred by uh, brown fat. This is something that hibernators, when they're hibernating, what happens is their um, complex two, which is where they convert the succinate, gets acetylated, it gets turned off. 
and succinate kind of builds up because it's a, you know, it's a block in their metabolic cycle. And so they've slowed their metabolism down and the succinate is coming around and it's getting diverted and brown fat takes that up and it stores it. And then um, they have to wake up. And so what happens is they send a lot of succinate into the, into the brown fat the brown fat burns all this succinate and this generates a tremendous amount of, um, of superoxide at complex two, uh, which regenerates NAD plus. And that's how they actually wake up from out of torpor. And that, so they have to have this very rapid metabolic surge. And a lot of that is done by burning succinate. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so the the idea of the succinate really is just to replace what is lost at um, at complex two when we're because of our stored unsaturated fats, um, and or if we're still continuing to consume unsaturated fats, um, the succinate will help uh, with that lack of complex two activity. But uh, the other thing that's been shown in mice trials, we also have a succinate um, receptor on our skeletal muscle. And the succinate seems to, um, the succinate receptor seems to convert our, uh, our, our skeletal muscle into a, uh, a very oxidative form of skeletal muscle. That the, that the skeletal muscle is actually kind of the preferred type. So in obesity, um, and I forget the exact, I think we have a lot of type two B muscle fibers. I, I forget them, but, but we do a lot of glycolytic, um, obese humans do a lot of glycolytic things with their muscles and they're making a lot of, um, they doing a lot of glycolysis and getting energy that way. And they can't necessarily burn, um, the glucose all the way to generate power in their muscles and the succinate reverts that and kind of can help your muscles get back to th those of a lean human actually um another way it sounds like it's uh reversing hibernation reversing for right well and, and and that may be and it may be tied in with exactly that because one of the things that um that is people wonder about hibernating animals is um so in a human, if you lay in a hospital bed for six months, you have all this muscle atrophy. Um, the hibernating animals don't have this, right? The hibernating animals in the spring, they, they, they preserve almost all their muscle mass. And so people are like, well, how do they do this? And one of the way might be that since they're, you know, since they're not burning the succinate and they're essentially storing the succinate to get as their fuel to get through winter, um, the, those succinate receptors might be saying like, oh, we're not in a hospital bed, we're just hibernating. So we should preserve our muscle mass. Um, and that may be the, that probably is why that mechanism is there. I, I mean, I would think. Um, and so it all kind of, <laughs> it all seems to work together. Uh, and, but the trials with the trials in rodents using succinate for like weight loss, um, exercise performance, you know, strength, endurance, uh nad plus levels are nothing short of amazing um and so and so that's why i'm that's why i'm very interested in uh in succinate as another supplement and so so really all those things though um you know succinate pyruvate and alpha lipoic acid are just ways of of keeping our nad pool oxidized and keeping in that burning mode rather than um, you know, once, once we have too much NADH and that pool gets too reduced, that puts us back into kind of fat storing mode again, which is where most of us probably spend much of our lives. Um, and so, yeah, these are kind of simple, safe things that tools that we can use to kind of lever. And so, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. That's brilliant. Um, I feel like, you know, with, the. Uh the the hope that's going around with uh metabolic therapies for for mental health and for losing weight that it's kind of exciting to think about delving a bit further and really understanding what the mechanisms are because it means you can experiment a little bit further you know with supplements with dietary tweaks that um will tell you more about 
what the overall mechanism is and where your body is at with it because i guess that's that's the thing that you're talking about is that um you you might you might be one of these lucky people who's still a yankees fan but probably given the way the world is uh you're in a post yankees fan phase and it's yeah. about working out how to potentially get back to that how to wake up from some kind of um metabolic slowdown that uh, that we all seem to be suffering from and it's exciting to think that we could understand why it happens and not just um experience it which is good enough in in and of itself yeah i know i i think so and i and i think that um yeah and i think there's a lot of interesting uh things that we can that we can do out there and, and just these simple tweaks but you're right if you understand what the goal is right it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like so much like we're like throwing darts against against the wall you know anymore it's like okay well well this is part of a you know this is part of a generalized strategy um we have this evolutionary basis for why did we get the way that we are now and therefore what do we do to try to get out of it right um and 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 realistically um you know a lot of the science that i'm talking about now is it's come out within the last three years right it's it's all very recent stuff um these trials with succinate and and other things and so it's i think it's an exciting time i think for a long time you know uh there was just so much that we didn't know and of course there's still so much that we don't know but uh my reading of the literature now seems like we're starting to get a, a hand, you know, a handle on the big picture and how it all kind of fits together. And um, obviously some of my ideas like torpor are not, uh, have not been embraced by the mainstream, we'll say. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's, I think if you really look at the evidence, it gets harder and harder to ignore. And then, yeah, you can, you can start to build strategies and, and there's a lot of other things out there, of course, that, that might, that, um, you know, uh, dietary flavones are very interesting. Like we said, metformin is a very interesting thing and that it lowers some of those, um, it lowers some of those pathways. You need a prescription for it here in the US. I don't know if that's true in the UK. Um, yeah. But it's been around a long time. It's obviously pretty safe. Um, so that's interesting to try. And, um, you know, yeah. And, these dietary flavones are interesting. Um, they are something that, uh, you know, I think people think of them as antioxidants. Uh, I, I'm not a big, I, I don't like antioxidants in general, uh, but the flavones are things that actually can block. Um, so I think in my recent, I have an obesity explained series on YouTube and I, on YouTube, and I talked about how some of the flavones actually block the activity of PARP which is the thing that, that breaks your NAD plus down because I, and I think it's because they, again, on that 3d shape, they have those ring shapes. And I think they look like, um, I think they look like NAD enough to kind of block the activity of some of those enzymes that are, um, that are converting the NAD plus to nicotinamide. And that may have some downside too of interfering with NAD plus metabolism in other ways um that's possible but but you know it's another interesting uh tool to kind of think about um quercetin and my my rice tin um and those kinds of things um yeah just kind of shooting off the top of my head of other ideas yeah uh people and might i guess be thinking um, about. sometime in the future we might be able to work out a bit more clearly in advance how stacking these types of um supplements in the short medium long term might work for an individual um or just general broad guidelines about how people might go about it but i guess that's a i think that's a a hopeful place to to stop thinking about how people can you know go out try it if they want to know more they can go to your blog um which is brilliant or your youtube channel also brilliant or follow you on twitter and I think I'm right in thinking that it's all the same name. Is that right? Uh, it's all fire in a bottle. Yeah. Fire in a bottle. Uh, twi Twitter, I think, is fire underscore bottle, but everything else is fire in a bottle. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. 
you know, I really appreciate you coming on and talking again. It's 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 exciting when someone gets excited about the science. <laughs> yes, well, I am a nerd, so it, that that helps, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, from one nerd to another, it's appreciated, and uh, um, I look forward to hear, hearing the response from the episode. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Brad. Um, good luck, everyone. <laughs>